Thank you for being here. And I hope that uh, our study tonight will be uh, informative and uh, interesting and a good uh, launching pad for all of the discussion tomorrow. Our topic, as has been announced, is the resurrection of Jesus. But not just the resurrection of Jesus. My topic is, what about the prophecies? Are there any prophecies about the resurrection of Jesus and uh, what do they uh, say? But mainly I'm going to deal on with the idea, are there any prophecies? One thing we learn in looking at the Gospels is that Jesus told the disciples in plain language about his death and his resurrection. In Luke chapter 24 at verse 6, after his death and resurrection, the angel said, He is not here, he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still with you in Galilee. So the angel said, see, he told you, you should have been ready. You should have known it. Didn't he tell you this in Galilee? Now, Jesus, it seems like, really started this speech uh, in the uh, 16th chapter of Matthew when he says, you know, whom do men say thy the son of man am? And so they answer that question. And it's from there. It says, and from that time, this is verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. From that time on. So I'd like to now go over to Mark's account because Mark really gives us a from that time on, I think, in this great, uh, in the capsule form. In fact, when you get to the end of Mark, Mark tells the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. And then he says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Well, many look at that. These signs shall follow them that believe that just, well, if you believe in Jesus, then these signs are going to follow you. But that's not what he was talking about. He's talking about these signs are going to follow you apostles who go forth and preach this, who believe. Because they, Mark's account is very clear, over and over and over again, he told them, and then he said, uh, he just rebuked them, really, after his resurrection for their slow heart and their unbelief. <clears throat> so in uh, Luke's account at Luke uh, 19, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. But others, one of the prophets that are risen from the dead. So not the Christ, but you're somebody that uh, is risen from the dead. And that was actually before he even died and was resurrected. But in Matthew's account, or Mark's account, chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and three days rise from the dead. Verse 32 says this, and he was stating the matter plainly. In fact, he was stating the matter so plainly that Peter rebukes him and he said, no, Lord, this is never going to happen to you. Now, why would Peter say that if he didn't understand what Jesus was talking about? Jesus, uh, Peter rebuked him surely out of this idea of uh, understanding. In fact, interesting, the word plainly, plainly there is the word parousia. It's the idea of a frankness or bluntness or uh, in publicity, something seen. So he told them plainly. Jesus says this, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not uh, setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Now that is, that will come up and I don't remember if I'll, I don't know if I'll remember that later, but that's an important passage, I think, in understanding the Old Testament prophecies. Then in chapter 9, there's the transfiguration, 9 of Mark, at verse 9. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them order not to relate any, uh, to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man should be risen from the dead. Now listen to this. 
And they seized upon that statement, Mark says, discussing with one another what rising the dead might mean. What is he talking about? Now he's already told them. And then he told them plainly. And now he tells them again and they're wondering, well, what that means. On the way to Jerusalem, in Mark chapter 10 at verse 32, they were on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, again, he took the twelve aside, told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, will hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Clearly, Jesus taught the twelve that there's going to be a resurrection. Not only that, the New Testament teaches us that the Old Testament teaches there's going to be a resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3, For what I received, I pass on to you first of all, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. The Scriptures say that He's going to rise again. Acts chapter 2, verse 31, Seeing what was ahead, He spoke of the resurrection of Christ. And we're going to get to this passage uh, more uh, clearly later. Chapter 13, we tell you the good news, what God promised our fathers, He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising Him from the dead. Now, there are many more than that, but I want you to just know the New Testament often talks about this uh, fulfillment of prophecies of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. But I'd like to go now to the road to Emmaus. This is Jesus after his resurrection, and uh, he is walking along. He walks along with two of them, and I want to read that because uh, we want to launch from here. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about all these things that had taken place. And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you're ex exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still looking sad. The one, and one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? Uh, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here this day? He said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word, and in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him up to, be, uh, to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And did, indeed, beside all this, it is the third day since these things have happened. But also some of the women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. He didn't say, you're slow of heart because I've told you over and over and over what's going to happen. He said, you're slow in the heart to believe because of all the prophets have said. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter his glory. And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scripture. And then in verse 44 says, These are my words which I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus says, and it's just a lot of places in the Old Testament, there's not just one or two places it seems like Moses talked about it. The Psalms talk about it. 
The prophets talk about it. The reason we're having this study really is because I was uh, in some of my casual reading. I read that and my little brain said, now why was that so difficult? If Moses and the prophets and the Psalms all talked about the resurrection of Jesus, why do these people have such a difficult const, uh, idea? Uh, why is it so difficult for them to grasp it? Peter sure didn't grasp it. He said, no, Lord, this is not going to happen to you. And they're still not grasping it, even though it's after his resurrection. So the first thing that I did, uh, by the way, I'll say the reason we did this, I, we were talking at a business meeting, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I'd like to do that. And Ralph said, why don't we just do the whole thing on the resurrection? So uh, this is grand. And again, I hope that what I have to say will just launch us into the resurrection. Why was it so difficult? Search the scripture for them. You think you have life, but they are they that testify me. But why is it so difficult? Well, I'll tell you one reason is because I don't know if they had a concordance. Maybe they didn't, but I have a great Bible program and I just looked up resurrection. You know, it starts in Matthew. You know, there is no word in the Old Testament resurrection. Now, there were some people who raised, and I'm going to notice that in just a minute, but it's always the word rise. And you have to look at the setting to see even what that means. But the word resurrection from the dead is not there. But I do know that the concept of the resurrection was not new with the disciples. It wasn't something that they didn't know anything about. In fact, Hebrews chapter 5 says, by faith, Enoch was taken. They all knew about Enoch. They all knew about Elijah. Then in chapter 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is. That's his existence. Listen now. It's the key. <laughs> and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. In chapter 11 at verse 13 of Hebrews. All these people were still living by faith when they died. And they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. People who say such show that they are looking for a country of their own. Instead, they were looking, uh, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly country. They were looking for something beyond this. Well, we can find that Elijah raised uh, the boy from, uh, from death, gives him back to his mother in 1 Kings chapter 17. And uh, Hebrews 11.35 says women receive their dead back to life again. Job says, if a man die, will he live again? All the days of my struggle, I will wait until my change comes. In the 16th Psalm, which is only 11 verses, it's all about this idea of the, the joys and the blessings of the faithful. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in thee. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good, uh, bes uh, I have no good beside thee. As for the saints that are on earth, they are the majestic ones in whom all my, is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their libations of blood, nor shall I take their name upon my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. <clears throat> it does support my lot, or you support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is on my right hand and I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will also dwell securely. For thou will not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither wilt thou allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Thou wilt make known to me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy right hand there are pleasures forever. Surely that's about the resurrection. Not just all of our resurrection, 
But specifically, as we will see, it's about the resurrection of Jesus. In 2 Samuel, David says, well, I, I can't bring the child back, but I can go to him. And then Jesus, in his last discourse to the disciples, in John 14, starts it like this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I'd like to look at that little phrase. If it were not so, I would have told you. You know what Jesus told the disciples that day? Your view of the resurrection, that is your view of the idea of the righteous and an eternal life is true. It's right. And if you would have had the wrong view, I would have corrected you. Now, there were at the time of Jesus, of course, Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection, but not these disciples. They believed in the resurrection. And he said, and if you'd have been wrong about that, I'd have straightened you out. So it's not that they don't believe in the resurrection. And it's not that they don't know that there are passages in the Old Testament where people were raised from the dead. Well, it takes some Bible interpretation is what it does. It takes some Bible interpretation. Remember about the Sadducees, they had this little story and about, you know, this man had seven wives and then you get in the resurrection, well, whose wife is she going to be? You know what, Jesus, he said, you don't know the power of God and you don't know the scripture. And then he gives them a scripture. He said, God said to Abraham, God said in the book of Moses at the bush, I am the God of Abraham. Who are you, Lord? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Jesus said, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, that's some interpretation, isn't it? Jesus said, when he spoke to Moses, he was speaking in the present tense. And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were already dead physically. But he speaks to it not, he doesn't say, <clears throat> I, was, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, I am present tense. And God is the God of the living. That was an argument to prove this idea of there is a resurrection. I believe the real reason that we, uh, that is so difficult or was so difficult for them, you know, it's a lot easier now for us. We, we get all those passages that tell us and explain to us. But it's because of the mystery. Because the gospel is, it was in the Old Testament, a mystery. What was that mystery? Wasn't it the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? The gospel message? It was a secret. Now, that doesn't mean that they couldn't learn it or couldn't know it. Surely, when Jesus told them exactly what it meant, they should have known it. But they didn't understand the scripture. In Romans chapter 16, verse 25, Now to him that was able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret in long ages past, but now it is manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all nations, leading to the obedience of faith. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, we do, however, speak the wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who come to nothing. No, we speak God's wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined to our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. They didn't know it. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It takes faith. 
it takes faith for them to see it. Let me explain. Now, there are many passages. There are many passages in the Old Testament that teach, and I'm only going to give you a few because we could just keep reading those all night, that teach about the eternal nature of Christ and His kingdom. Daniel 2, 34, In the days of those kings, God of heaven shall set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will stand forever. Daniel 7, verse 14, He has given authority, glory, honor, and a sovereign power, all people, nations, and men of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Micah chapter 4, verse 7. I will make the lame a remnant, those driven away to a strong, uh, those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day forward and forever. Okay. Luke chapter 1. He should be called great. Verse 32. He should be called great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Ah, uh, now you get it? He's going to live forever. He's going to reign forever. You know, that's what Peter was rebuking him for. Peter said, no, no, this is not going to happen to you. Because you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. In John chapter 12, verse 31, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And you know what they said? They said, he said this to show what kind of death he would die. And the crowd spoke. We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man will be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Oh, that's the problem. No, we see that verse that says the Son of Man's going to live forever. And therefore... The concept of the resurrection never entered their mind. There are two concepts. The first concept is the Christ lives forever. But there is another concept. And that other concept is his suffering. And there's, you know, Isaiah 53. There's all these passages about his suffering. How do you put those together? How do you put those together? There's only one way, and that's the resurrection. Even though I know of no place in the Old Testament that says Jesus is going to die and then be resurrected. Now we have his death, and we have him living. You've got to put those together. Now I say it takes people to faith. Because I think this is exactly what Abraham did. Abraham showed us how that we should interpret the Word of God. Because Abraham was, first of all, given a promise. He said, I'm going to give you a son, and that son is going to bring about a descendant that will bless the whole family, all the families of the earth, the whole world. Not Ishmael. Isaac is born, and God said, this is him. This is the son. And then... As the child grows up, gets to be a lad, he said, now I want you to take this son, your only son, and I want you to go sacrifice him on the mountain. <coughs> Abraham didn't say, no, Lord. No, Lord, this will never be. Because don't you remember? Don't you remember what you told me? You told me that this son is going to have a descendant way down the line somewhere that's going to bless everyone. Hebrews tells us that Abraham just said, there's got to be a resurrection. Now, did God tell Abraham, I, I, I'm going to raise him from the dead? No, that's just, the, it has to be. 
Because both of these, for both of these things to be true, there has to be a resurrection. So my lesson tonight is simply this. If you want to know any passages in the Old Testament about the resurrection of Jesus, all you have to find are passages about his death. And when you do, those are passages about his resurrection. Just like in Abraham, the promise is made. He's going to be eternal. Oh, yeah, but look at all these other passages. What about those? Well, they're both true. And the only way to make them work is the resurrection. So, for the remaining time, I actually set my clock today so I wouldn't go way over. So the remaining time I'd like to spend just a little bit. I'm not going to spend much time. Maybe we'll be working these verses over and over in the next few days. But I want to spend just a little bit looking at the arguments or the verses that the apostles used. Because they say, you know, it's from Moses and uh, the prophets and the Psalms. First of all, let's look at Peter. Peter says this. Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, verse 11. Trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing. Okay, so these prophets of the Old Testament, they're writing and they, they're trying to figure it out too. When is this all going to happen and what's really going to happen? When he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow. How did Peter argue it? Just exactly like I just said. Sufferings of Christ and glory. How's that happen? Got to be a resurrection. Luke chapter 24, verse 26. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things? Now this is when Peter, or this is when Jesus is talking to them and trying to open their minds to the Old Testament. And he says, didn't the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Two things have to happen. Why is it so difficult to wrap your head around a resurrection? Acts chapter 2, beginning of verse 23. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him to the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was not impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Faith, remember. If he's the Christ, he can't remain dead. Christ, uh, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before my face because he is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the way of life. You will fit, fill me with joy in his presence. What's he say? Suffering? then glory, and then he quotes the 16th Psalm. Only 11 verses. Now you might say, well, they probably looked at that Psalm and they thought, that's David. I'm sure that's what they thought. The reason I'm sure that's what they thought is because Peter goes on to say, and uh, <clears throat> David's tomb's right over there. So it's not talking about David. It's talking about the Lord. Resurrection. He had to be glorified. And this, this uh, psalm is all about God is in control. God's going to make it work. You just put your hope and your trust in him, not in wickedness and not in the world. God's going to make it work. Verse 29. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. His tomb is here with us to this day. 
But he was a prophet and knew that God had made promise. See, God made a promise on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing this ahead, he did not abandon, was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see corruption. But God has raised Jesus up. He said, God made promise. Just because he had to suffer doesn't mean that he's forsaken. And it's not David because the scripture clearly said he won't, won't decay. That's a pretty good, pretty quick resurrection, isn't it? Verse 34, for David has not ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord. He keeps making these arguments. But see, he had to sit on the right hand. He had to be there forever. Here is this grand promise. And you crucified him. Therefore, he's resurrected. He uses, in fact, the apostles use this quite a few times. They make the point, and you crucified him. In other words, he really is dead. Don't say, no, he's not dead. He's dead. You know he's dead. You crucified him. But if he's the Messiah, the only other alternative, or only conclusion can be that he's resurrection. Uh, Acts 13, or Acts 3, rather, verse 8, 18. Can't read my own. Uh, and this is a printed page, not even my own scribbles. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets saying, that Christ would suffer. And then verse 24, Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many of us spoke, have foretold of these days. Verse 26, When God raised up His servant, He sent Him first to you to bless you by turning each one of you from His wicked ways. Well, when Peter gets to the, the second sermon, now I don't know what verses he used because we're really not told so much what verses he used there, but he says the same argument. <clears throat> he had to suffer. And they all spoke about that. And so therefore, he had to be resurrected. Acts 13, verse 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem... And their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Now, here Paul is at uh, the Pisidian Antioch, I believe, anyway, he's preaching in a synagogue. And so, he is going to use these prophets, not just the fact that, you know, I'm an eyewitness and so on, but he's going to use the prophets. And he said, now the people in Jerusalem... Didn't know. Might have just been talking about the Gentiles, maybe talking about the Jewish leaders as well. They didn't know those verses. For though they found no cause of death in him, they desired that Pilate, uh, they desired Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come, uh, came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. God fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in this, uh, in that he hath raised him from the dead, raised him again. As it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. Oh, there's another one in there. He raised Lazarus. He raised Jairus' daughter. They died again. See, this idea, he's, here's the eternal nature of Jesus. He resurrected never to die. Again, he says, I will give you the sure mercies of David. He said, so... I want to prove to you that he's never going to die again. I'm going to give you the mercies of David. Wherefore he saith in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Same concept. 
the sure mercies of David, not suffer your holy one to see corruption, the same thing. Again, <clears throat> he says, uh, <clears throat> I, have I, have I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. And he said to me, you are my son. Today have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as thine inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as thy possession. Now therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, uh, O kings, rather. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, lest he become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in him. What's that passion about? Him being the king. Same thing. Since he's got to be the king. The idea of his resurrection. That's the sure mercies of David. God promised that on your, on, your, on my throne, really, your son's going to sit on my throne forever. So when he says he gives you the sure mercies of David, all he's saying is, remember, <laughs> remember these eternal promises. So he had to be resurrected. Let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through, through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you would not be freed through the law of Moses. Take heed, therefore, so that the things spoken of and the prophets may not come uh, upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone might describe it to you. See, only the faithful, the just shall live by faith. And it's only those who don't have faith. They look at those two positions and they say, both of them can't be true. He can't live forever and die. But only the faithful, as faithful Abraham would say, God will work it out. God will work it out. Acts 26, now Jesus, or not Jesus, but Paul is back to some Jews and he is arguing with these Jews. He's giving them argumentation. I don't mean he's, he's discussing with the Jews and convincing them that Jesus is the Christ. He says, but I have had God's help to this very day. And so I stand here and testify to the small and great alike. I am saying nothing more than what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that Christ would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. I'm going to read two passages and I'm finished. Remind you of Luke 24, 26, which says it simply. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Revelation 1 verse 18, I am the living one. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. <clears throat>